Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ash Arder. I'm the studio fellow at Fiber this year, and it is my pleasure to read the bio for our distinguished guest, uh, Jovencio de la Paz. Jovencio de la Paz received a Master of Fine Art in Fiber from the Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2012 and a Bachelor of Fine Art with an emphasis on fiber and material studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2008. They have exhibited work in solo and group exhibitions both nationally and internationally, most recently at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, New York, Cranbrook, Museum of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, R and Company Gallery in New York, New York, uh, Vacation Gallery in New York, New York, the 2019 Portland Biennial at Disjecta in Portland, Oregon, the Museum of Craft and Folk Art in Los Angeles, California, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, Colorado, Seoul Arts Center in Seoul, South Korea, the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland, Oregon, the Hyde Park Arts Center in Chicago, Yuri Gallery in Seoul, South Korea, among others. They are represented by Chris Sharp Gallery in Los Angeles, California. And in 2022, Jovencio was awarded the prestigious United States Arts Fellowship for their significant contributions to the field of craft Please join me in welcoming Vincio to the stage. Hi, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to return to Cranbrook um, and to get to speak to you uh, from behind uh, this particular podium. Um, this, uh, this visit was canceled originally last year, and, um, and many sort of events, uh, in-person events, that I was scheduled to do were canceled, and they were all sort of rescheduled for like the next eight weeks. Um, but uh, I had sort of a wonderful opportunity actually um, over COVID, if, if there can be a wonderful opportunity there. Um, I, I gave a, a lot of talks on Zoom, um, and the words have become like poison <laughs> in my mouth. Um, so I've had a chance really to rewrite a lot um, of what I want to share with you today. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing I think um, that I, I have to address um, is that I am like a, a secretly a painter who became a weaver. Um, I really wanted to study painting, actually, you know, when I was 18 at the School of the Art Institute uh, in Chicago. Um, but uh, for a variety of reasons, I found that the painting program there was not really having the conversation um, that I was interested in particularly. Um, I had wanted to talk about um, identity politics, about being an immigrant, um, about being a queer person. Um, and this was a time uh, in, in the painting department um, in Chicago um, where there was not so much interest in these kinds of discussions. So I found myself uh, fairly lost um, as, as a student. Um, and very randomly, um, I ran into a fiber professor, um, Diana Guerrero Macia, and I just asked her, what should I do? What, should, what classes should I take? And she said, I think you should try uh, textiles. I think you should try fiber. Um, and it was really there that I found a kind of platform um, to talk about uh, a lot of the subjects that I was interested in, um, labor, um, invisible labor, migrant labor, um, all of these subjects. And it was at the loom um, in, in weaving that I sort of found a home. It's very interesting, those of you who know me um, from my time at Cranbrook, uh, uh, things changed in grad school. Uh, I sort of had a, a, a crisis of identity again <laughs> and got rid of all the yarn, threw away. I was like, I just wanted to perform. I want to be a performance artist, no more of this material stuff. Um, but over the years, I've I re really returned uh, to weaving as sort of the, the primary language that I engage in. Um, but also, I've returned to this uh, kind of formal um, uh, parameters of abstraction. Um, and I'll talk about uh, all of the sort of twists and turns that have brought me um, to, to this particular um, kind of work. But um, you know, as a weaver, I, I am very committed 
um, two very Weaverly concerns, um, questions about uh, color, about uh, texture, about line, um, and the, my, my, my uh, training as a weaver was really based um, in this sort of uh, questions about tactility, about haptic knowledge, um, about the body um, as sort of the, uh, the organizer um, of, of all of these qualities. Um, but very quickly, you know, I was, I was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago at a time uh, where a really new kind of emergent technology in weaving uh, became part of the curriculum. And that is a digital loom um, called the Thread Controller um, 1 and then the Thread Controller 2 Digital Jacquard Loom. Um, and this was very interesting. Uh, I was very resistant. I, I, I was very committed to my traditional um, four harness uh, floor loom. Um, but the technology, um, uh, what made it curious to me was I had been committed to this ancient craft. Um, and I began to realize a very strong connection between um, weaving as a process and also the computer um, and the, the digital. And so I was trying to, to juggle both these things, which I have realized um, over the years I have done in my sort of personal life. You know, I was just at the cusp of being a digital native. Um, I didn't have a computer in my room growing up. I remember when it came, I remember the day it came. Um, so trying to balance the, the, these two qualities, the tensions between these two qualities, sort of haptic embodied knowledge um, and the digital, you know, uh, one of the um, kind of pivotal classes I took at the Art Institute of Chicago was taught um, by Anne Wilson, um, an alum of Cranbrook and really a, a teacher of teachers, it's an incredible teacher. And um, the class was called Time, Material, and the Everyday. And that class was really focused on handwork, um, on mending, um, on, on stitch. Um, but at the same time, I was realizing that the, the digital, digital tools have become also our everyday, right? Um, I come into contact with both constantly. Um, and so throughout my work, I'm um, looking at kind of the interstitial space between um, the hand and the body and the digital. And these are some images from a recent solo show um, in LA at, at my gallery, Chris Sharp. Um, and all of these textiles um, were woven on the TC2 digital jacquard loom. Um, and they were woven uh, and, and designed um, not by me, uh, but by an algorithm which I developed um, in collaboration with a software engineer. Um, this is sort of the, the primary area of my, my research now um, is in creating um, specific software, specific algorithms, or adapting software um, to generate patterns um, at the digital loom. Um, so in this talk, I, I want to definitely, you know, I'll definitely talk about my work and my research, um, but I also want to talk a little bit about um, my, my autobiography, um, sort of where I come from, the ways in which I believe that information has led me to make the kind of work that I do. Uh, I also want to talk about um, science fiction. Uh, I want to talk about mid-century modernism. You know, we are at Cranbrook, one of the great laboratories for mid-century modern design, so it makes sense. I want to talk about uh, craft, um, both in terms of um, ancient craft, but also speculative future craft. Um, and hopefully, all of these things will we'll weave together into some, um, some kind of uh, logic in the end. Um, but a, a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Singapore. Um, my father was a geologist, and um, it's very interesting. Geology was like um, the, 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 a very desirable job. Being a geologist was very desirable um, in Southeast Asia at that time um, because they discovered pe petrol, they discovered oil um, in Indonesia. So you know, every young person wanted to, to uh, take part in, that, um, in the, the wealth that that uh, brought the region. Uh, but because of uh, very complicated socio-political um, realities, my family had to very quickly move um, to the US. They were trying to find some place to move. Um, and we ended up in, in the US. Um, and so we moved to uh, rural Oregon. Um, and I think this was really uh, shocking place for them. You know, they would come from uh, really metropolitan, urban, Singapore, Southeast Asia, Jakarta, and then suddenly this expanse um, of space. And admittedly, um, it was a very 
bucolic kind of pastoral place to grow up. Um, but at this time, um, you know, th this part of Oregon was incredibly um, agricultural, very rural. And we found ourselves being like the only family of color um, in, in, in the region. So um, we were just sort of naturally, and it, it felt natural to me. I look back at it and it, it's very unnatural, but we were the target of a lot of um, violence and vandalism. And also at this time, I, I didn't have the language for it, uh, but I was discovering that I, I was a queer person. Um, and so I, as like the one queer person of color in, in school, I was myself also the target of a lot of, um, a lot of fear. And, uh, and I think that this is not unusual. I'm not saying this to elicit some kind of empathy from you. Um, but what it did do um, was give me this uh, sense of an exterior world that was very frightening um, and an interior world, which I didn't really know how to uh, confront. Um, an interior world of creativity, of ideas, um, of uh, all kinds of um, uh, uh, subjects, including science fiction. Um, so this was like <laughs> how I spent a lot of my time um, as a young person, you know, reading science fiction, playing uh, fantasy video games, um, watching Star Trek. Um, and in some ways, I suppose you could call it escapism. Um, I, I felt like I needed other worlds uh, to occupy because the world I was confronted with um, uh, was I'm not so interested um, in, in my presence. Um, and, you know, I, again, I, I think that this is not uh, unusual. The more I meet um, uh, people of color and queer folk who have grown up in rural areas, fantasy and sci-fi seems to be um, a, a common kind of theme. Um, science fiction, you know, as, uh, as a, a, a way of approaching the world um, as a thing to dwell on. Um, I think that you know any person, I, I guarantee if, if you um, have had to flee um, across borders, as so many people of color in this country have had to, if you've had to hide um, in plain sight, um, as so many uh, queer and trans folk have had to, um, you spend a lot of time dwelling on the possibility of a kinder future a more equitable future. That's not unique to people of color or, uh, or queer and trans people. Um, but I, I don't think of it as, um, as excessive or I don't think of it um, as, as a wasteful pursuit. Um, I think of it as a survival mechanism. And so science fiction plays a really big role uh, in my work. This is a textile actually in the collection of Ian MacDonald <laughs> here at Cranbrook. Um, I traded, I traded um, with him for a piece. Um, and uh, this is the first of a series um, of textiles which I wove um, following fairly closely descriptions of textiles in science fiction novels. Um, so this is a textile uh, that I designed woven um, from descriptions of a tapestry um, in Ursula K. Le Guin's um, epic science fiction novel, The Dispossessed. Um, and, uh, in, in many ways, uh, I was thinking about the way in which craft, ancient crafts, um, are projected into distant futures. Um, what do they look like? How do they exist there? Um, this is a textile from uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, woven from descriptions of a textile uh, in a Philip K. Dick um, short, short novel um, called The Last of the Masters, which is like kind of an anarchist, um, uh, manifesto in lots of ways. Um, and I had a, a really interesting opportunity uh, to display that textile in the uh, ceremonial office of governor, uh, the former governor uh, of Oregon's, uh, her ceremonial office um, in, in Salem, Oregon. Um, and it's this kind of, you know, it's Oregon. Uh, the, the interior of that space is sort of replete with objects of colonial frontierism, of manifest destiny. Um, so it was very interesting in this sort of seat of government to place this textile, uh, which comes from a really anarchist kind of manifesto. Um, I enjoyed that kind of soft um, resistance, but I was particularly interested uh, in this pairing. Um, my textile you can see is in the background, um, and then there's this vitrine uh, in the foreground. And I'll just read um, some, this is some curatorial information uh, about this vitrine. The vitrine, which is lined with gold leaf and silk cloth, 
contains fragments of the lunar surface collected by American astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong during the Apollo 11 mission. The four fragments, which are right here in this tiny glass bubble, weigh about 0.05 grams in total. Included in the display is a diminutive synthetic fabric representation of the Oregon State flag, which traveled to the moon with the crew of the Apollo 11 for this specific symbolic purpose. The lunar rocks and flag were given to the state of Oregon in 1965. Similar lunar sample displays were gifted to all 50 states of the Union, as well as all countries recognized as legitimate governments of the world. The small plaque reads, this fragment is a portion of a rock from the Tars Littoral Valley of the Moon. It is given as a symbol of the unity of human endeavor and carries with it the hope of the American people for a world at peace. So quite an idealistic <laughs> project and statement. Um, and what I found interesting about, about this pairing, um, you know, sort of my dystopian textile with this very utopic vision of technology and the future is that um, as we, as we study uh, the history of computer technology, of many kinds of technology, we start seeing this um, rhyme, which is our technologies, even, um, even our most ancient, some of our most ancient technologies, right? Um, many of our technologies carry uh, simultaneously kind of our ideals for utopic um, future, the way in which technology might solve the problems of the present day. Uh, but also carry with it like this constant sense of imminent destruction. As you know, like we didn't go to the moon for this idealistic purpose. We went there, this, in this height of uh, human technology, we went there as a display of um, military dominance over uh, the Soviet Russians um, during the space race. So this rhyme will appear quite a few times, I think, in, it, it appears quite a few times in my research, this quality of technology both um, containing our hopes for a utopic or idealistic future, but at the same time uh, a threat of, of destruction. Um, and so as I was, uh, I, <laughs> as, as I watch Star Trek, um, and as I look at science fiction, again, I'm always looking for these uh, moments where ancient or traditional crafts are projected into the distant future. And this is a scene um, from Star Trek uh, Insurrection, um, and what's happening is you know, Jean-Luc Picard and the Enterprise crew, they're on this planet where the, um, the beings who live on this planet live these um, extraordinarily long lives, and they use their, their time to develop themselves physically, spiritually, in arts and crafts, a, a very peaceful society. And so Jean-Luc Picard is, is admiring this quilt, um, and he says, this is extraordinary craftsmanship. Um, and, um, the character on the left, who is one of these long-lived beings, says, it's the work of students. They're almost ready to become apprentices. In 30 or 40 years, some of them will take their place among the artisans. And Jean-Luc Picard says um, very wistfully, oh, apprenticing for 30 years. Um, I, I show this, uh, if, I, I think it's funny, of course, and I'm always looking for these moments in science fiction, but um, in, uh, when I was just out of undergrad, I got the chance um, to go to a craft conference in uh, South Carolina, and this was not like an academic conference, this was like a practical conference um, for entrepreneurs, uh, for Etsy businesses, et cetera, and it was very interesting. Um, you know, I was trying to support myself uh, out of school, and the, uh, two of the keynote speakers were uh, both special effects artists and set designers um, for Star Trek, for the X-Files, um, a few other uh, science fiction uh, sort of uh, television shows. And they said something that struck me, and it still strikes me today. I think about it a lot. Um, they said that, uh, in general, artists and designers, one of their goals is to contemplate um, and discuss the uh, qualities of their moment, right? The events of their moment, the, the, their times. But they said that their job in creating set designs for these films and TV shows is to imagine an art and design of the future. Um, so trying to imagine the aesthetics, the, um, the, the objects, the furniture, um, the art on the walls of 400 years from now. Really interesting kind of mental exercise, right? Um, and I became really obsessed with this idea. Um, and I began uh, really noticing um, the kind of aesthetic, the way in which set designers in popular science fiction um, imagine the design of the future, right? So this is, of course, um, 
Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, and in this particular scene, um, these red, um, these, these chairs, the, the gin chairs of Oliver Morg, um, play a really dominant role. Now, the chairs were designed within the same decade as when the film was made, but here they're, they're thought of as this um, distant future, which I find very curious. Um, of course, uh, you begin to see this rhyme again and again in a lot of sci popular science fiction, a lot of popular visions of the future um, use mid-century modern design um, as a kind of aesthetic of, of the future. And of course, um, this is uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's um, epic film Solaris, um, where you know our, our beloved tulip table of Erosarnin plays this very um, important role. So again, this object design um, in, in the mid-century period projected hundreds, um, hundreds and hundreds of years in the future to represent um, sort of futuristic aesthetic. Uh, Ethan Hawke in, in Gattaca. Um, this film takes place primarily in um, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, extraordinary civic center for Marin County. And if you've ever been, has anyone ever been there? It's very, feels like the future. <laughs> you know, it feels like a different planet. And I, I guess the, the question um, that this poses to me is why does design of this particular period, this mid-century modern period, why does it strike us as of the future? And why is it popularly imagined as the, the aesthetics of the future. And one theory that um, I really like is that, you know, um, Saarinen, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, many, of the, many of the designers of mid-century modern period, they were not designing for the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, they were designing for some utopic vision of the future, right? So that intention carries on in our popular vision of what the future should look like, right? The sense of, I'm a utopic um, vision of the future. But what I think is so important um, and critical to see um, when reading film or popular aesthetics um, is that these are futures largely void of people of color, um, indigenous people, um, of queer people. It's a, it's a very particular um, aesthetic future of, of whiteness, um, of privilege, and of access. Um, and so I, I, I think in many ways, of course it's important um, what we imagine the future to be, um, but I think it's equally important uh, who imagines a future, whose imagination gets to become the popular imagination of a future aesthetic. And I'm you know, very pleased that today um, there are many, many uh, people of color and queer folk writing science fiction and adding their identities to this, um, this vision of the, of the future. Um, just as an aside, because I think it's so interesting, and I love Stanley Kubrick, you know, those of you who have seen the film, you, you're sort of, it's like this three hour long endurance of like sleek, minimal design. And then um, at the sort of penultimate scene, um, like the character, I don't think I'm giving anything away, um, you know, he's dying. Um, and his, this sort of extreme experience of the body, right? Death is like the final extreme experience. Um, Stanley Kubrick introduces all these Baroque and Rococo objects, and it's striking because of the opulence. I mean, and I, I sort of liken it to this sort of ecstatic physical experience like um, Bernini's uh, Ecstasy of St. Teresa, right? Sort of like return to the body um, at, at this moment of death. Um, I think it's, it's also very obvious to lots of you, but I, I, will, I will say, um, these utopic visions of the future, this utopic design, many filmmakers and um, set designers are using uh, not as descriptions of utopia, but descriptions of dystopia, right? The, the threshold between utopic vision and dystopic vision is, re is really narrow. And this is um, Severance. Has pe have people seen Severance and Apple TV? It takes place um, almost entirely in um, Eero Saarinen's extraordinary um, uh, Bell Labs complex in, um, who was it, Hol Holcomb, Holdem, New Jersey? I can't remember the, the city of New Jersey, but yeah, this um, really glorious like, cathedral to um, modern design, you know, our, our, our beloved um, Saarinen <laughs> uh, design. Um, but in the film, in, in the TV show, if you've seen it, um, you know that this space is a depiction of hell, right? That the, the characters, though they work in this like, um, exquisite um, uh, designed environment, they, they are trapped in a kind of continuous 
hellscape. Um, and you, though you can't see the, the stem, the, here again is Sar Saarinen's um, beloved tulip table. Um, another recent film, which I think uh, uses this sort of mid-century modern aesthetic uh, as a description um, of oppression or of hell, a dystopia, um, is uh, um, the film uh, Don't Worry Darling, um, Olivia Wilde's, is that right? Don't Worry Darling, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and the, the film, those of you who have seen it, you know, takes place largely, uh, entirely in Palm Springs um, around the architecture of, of Richard Dutra, the, um, the, the sort of, um, again, this, this kind of uh, West Coast, uh, mid-century modern paradise. Um, but there are moments in the film where the architecture literally is crushing um, Florence Pugh, the character. And, um, you know, th there's a lot of um, writing about this film now that, that deals with the sort of um, the feminist critique that is in this film. I won't go too deeply into that. Um, but again, interesting to notice the use of this architecture, this design, um, as, a, as a depiction of a dystopia. Of course, it's this period um, of design where um, we began to have this idea of better living through science, right? So um, the space race has happened. Um, we're getting a lot of new technologies in the home as a result of, of the space race. So like the, the microwave, for example, it's supposed to end all kitchen drudgery and free up um, people to pursue other things and um, the television and the radio, um, all of these things. Um, are beginning to become a very, you know, the, the, the idea we have of American domestic space. Um, and it's also this period where um, the computer is beginning to appear more and more in, um, in popular culture. Um, and it's sort of this, um, this tension again, right? The sort of the presence of these technologies which are supposed to make our lives um, utopic and better. Um, they're, uh, they maybe haven't, you know, um, just as a, as a general kind of statement. I think, of course, the, the best depiction of this idea of better living through science, again, in Stanley Kubrick's um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, HAL 9000, this sort of supreme caretaker, if you remember, this computer, this machine, um, feeds all of the astronauts, cleans the spaceship, uh, does all the work, plays games with the astronauts, um, and it goes horribly wrong um, in the end. Um, so in, in terms of um, making a bridge between uh, my interests in science fiction and these, in these sort of the, the emergence of uh, technology um, in um, everyday life, um, I want to talk a bit about Joseph Marie Jacquard, um, who for all, um, for, for, in the opinion of many historians, is sort of the inventor of the punch card Jacquard boom. Um, so if HAL 9000 is sort of the height of computer technology, um, Jacquard's loom um, is one of the first kind of attempts at computation. And what Jacquard realizes um, in the 17th and 18th century is that very complex mathematical patterns um, can be expressed through a um, series of punch cards, right? So that, that, that patterns, because they, are, um, they repeat, uh, because they're sort of discrete numerical moments, um, they can be expressed in a sort of binary operation, which is punch cards. And the reason this happens is because of you know, industrialization and the demand for more textiles, more pattern textiles, the pattern, um, the, the amount of labor begins to exceed kind of the human capacity um, to hold. And so this technology essentially, and, and we, can, we still have this relationship with the computer, it's like second brain, right? It's like our external brain. We defer um, a lot of this intellectual labor to these machines. Um, and weaving and binary code um, are, are, so in, are so deeply linked. Um, I'd like to show this image. Um, you know, we have here on, on the left, the black, white, black, white checkerboard, the binary code. The actual 101010 of um, computer programming, the binary code, and then the over under, over under, over under of weaving, another expression um, of binary code. So they're, they're very, very linked in this way. Um, this is a, a, an image of um, a punch card, jack card loom um, in Massachusetts, and you can sort of see here um, strings of punch cards going into sort of the brain of the loom. The way this works is wherever there is a hole, 
in a punch card, a thread can move up and down, or up, rather. And then wherever there's no hole, the thread can't move. And so it's from this very, very simple, um, this very, very simple operation um, that you, know, you can see these um, very exquisite, complex um, textiles can be produced. Um, every other year at the University of Oregon, um, except during a recent COVID time, um, I get to bring students to the Liceo Foundation in Florence, Italy, which is a really a, a preeminent um, jacquard, uh, punch card jacquard weaving um, atelier, and um, they work only in silk and gold, really, really fine uh, materials. But these are the 18th century machines. And so the, the students spend all their time painting, you know, making designs in gouache, translating them into um, a grid, uh, and then taking that grid, translating that into the punch cards. This is not a student project, this is an archival project. Um, this is a very, very complex set of cards. And then we string them up, and then we can weave, um, we can weave the, the numerical data um, as, uh, as, as cloth. And something that I think is really extraordinary about seeing an ancient computer like this um, is you get a sense of kind of the material weight of the data. And this is, I think, uh, something we don't think about so much, right? Our experience um, of data, um, of the digital, is we often feel is very disembodied, right? It's like I look through my phone, you know, everything is stored in the cloud. Um, there's no sort of physical trace of these technologies, which of course is inaccurate, right? Like all of our data is stored in massive data centers that create enormous carbon footprints. Um, and you know, a lot of them are actually in Oregon, and I've, I've gone to try and see them. Um, so Google and Facebook or, or Meta um, have data centers in Oregon, which house, um, you know, the, the, they're incredibly hot inside um, these, these enormous football field size buildings because they're constantly having to cool the computers down so they don't overheat. Um, so in, in an in a interesting sort of parallel way, um, this building in, in Florence is really designed, um, it's like designed on ramps to accommodate the movement of these giant, uh, you know, these 100 plus pound stacks of punch cards. Um, but it's data, right? It's, it's numbers um, given kind of a physical embodiment. Um, if you're ever interested in going here, I have a running email list of people that we bring for about three weeks. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, it's, it's hard work. It's Florence in the summer. You know, this is like industrial, this is like pre-industrial, it's getting to be industrial kind of production. It's loud, there are mosquitoes everywhere, and when you're punching the cards, if you make a mistake, it's such a pain, so if the mosquitoes land on you, you just keep going and you deal with it later. Um, but extraordinary, really extraordinary tools to see operate. And there I am, I'm very excited. <laughs> Um, with my punch cards strung up um, on the, in the brains of these looms, and then here's the, the project I will. This was a very interesting project. I actually like, went in this loop of technology where I used, uh, again, software I designed, created an algorithm, created the pattern, then reverse engineered it through the centuries <laughs> to become punch cards, and then woven on, on this sort of silk, this exquisite silk and gold um, jacquard loom. And of course, as many of you know, um, IBM's first computers, uh, the IBM 100, um, these were run by punch cards also. Um, so these are stacks and stacks of punch cards um, that are used to calculate, basically, uh, th this room-sized computer is not stronger than a pocket calculator, right? It's like very, very, very limited, um, but required this enormous amount of physical labor to operate. Um, and it's sort of at this point, you know, so here's an example of a Jacquard punch card um, and then an, an early IBM punch card. They're really identical, the same binary, the same um, language of binary code. Uh, of course, today our, our um, computers and our devices don't use punch cards of any kind. They use microchips. And all microchips do are um, send electric signals either on or off, um, which are the binary signals that the computer then interprets as whatever data, um, whatever um, interface data we, we, we need it to be. Um, so having had this knowledge, I was like, okay, um, <laughs> uh, I'm working with uh, these ancient computers, um, and I, I feel like I came from uh, an education in the fiber material studies department at SIC and also here at Cranbrook um, that that really in, uh, influenced me to have this attitude, which is um, if you're gonna use a tool, 
um, the tool itself, the process you're using, should inform your work, the ideas that you're working with. Um, so I, I sort of took it upon myself, um, very randomly, I was never planning to do this with my life. I took it upon myself to learn how to, to program, um, to, to write code. Um, and I am not a programmer, I'm not an engineer. Um, basically everything I learned initially was from Reddit and I used processing to create uh, very simple drawing tools. Um, but I can create software that communicates with a digital jacquard loom and I can um, uh, collaborate with algorithms um, and at times artificial intelligence um, to, create, um, to create textiles. So this is sort of um, some early examples of textiles I was weaving um, using the software I wrote called Weave Writer. Weave Writer is a kind of MS Paint, I guess you could call it like an, you remember MS Paint? Do people remember that? Like pixel art MS Paint. It's like that um, and has all these sort of funny capabilities. Um, one of them is, uh, so this textile, basically um, I'm drawing, just like with the Wacom tablet and stylus, but I programmed the computer to sort of draw with me and respond um, to where I'm making just these, um, these very simple sort of hash marks. And so it reaches a certain critical mass. I mean, I'm working at a pixel level. And if anyone can remember, I have a really great story about pixels. In the Q&A, just ask me about the pixel. Um, I have a weird relationship with it. But so we're drawing together. Right? We're collaborating to make this textile. And because it, we're working at a pixel length at a certain density, this can become a textile at the TC2 loom. So not using traditional structures at all. I'm just working with the pixel um, to, to, to produce um, the weavable forms. And those of you who have been in the workshop, you know <laughs> this very important relationship between the pixel and the weave structure. Um, I won't go through all of the, uh, the specifics of the software, but essentially it had um, a variety of capabilities to sort of self-generate patterns. So I would, give the, I would often give the software um, a very simple line drawing, um, almost like a doodle, and then it would try and respond in a variety of different ways. Um, so in, in this situation, um, the, sort of, the two sort of circles, I'm drawing one circle, and the computer is sort of drawing the other circle, and they're sort of, um, uh, they meet in, in the center. And so I, I often feel that the aesthetic that results from these interactions with the digital, it's like neither human nor computer entirely. I think of them as a sort of hybrid um, language. And I love this idea um, that you might be familiar with, um, this idea of a ghost in, a, in the machine mm -hmm. that is at a certain point when systems like artificial intelligence um, get very complex, unpredictable things start happening. And for me, it's a, it's a real joy um, to stumble upon these unpredictable sort of qualities of the software I'm writing. So in this textile, um, I was basically giving the computer these very simple diagonal, kind of like lightning bolt lines, and then it uh, sort of extrapolated out from my lines uh, the, its own sort of um, pattern, and you can sort of see it start to degrade at the edges, so this fuzziness, this kind of um, softness in the software starts, starts to appear. I try not to say this softness in the software too often, but. It's, it's a hard, you know, it's like weavers love their puns. You know. um, this is a, a similar textile made in that way. And, you know, I was very, uh, um, I was working really just at a pixel level, at the smallest kind of amount of information I could give. And the result was often, um, I was very pleased with these. You know, they have kind of a holographic surface, it's like a damask. Those of you who know what damask is, a damask is sort of um, a, a fine kind of um, textile where the emergence of the pattern, it's, all, it's often all one color, but the emergence of the pattern comes from the threads hitting the light in different ways. So as you move around these textiles, um, they really come to life. They're very optical. Um, it's hard to capture in, in photographs, but they have this sort of frenzied, um, almost like uh, static on a television sort of surface, which comes from this damask quality, right? The, the slight um, way that the light hits the surface um, produces all of these optical effects. But they were very flat. You know, there was this flatness that, um, though I was happy with these, I was like, you know, I, I'm, I want to push the structures further. I want to push the physicality a bit further. I'm sorry, I'm, this is like, seems like dramatic pause, but I actually do need to just have some water. So I'd, I'd written Weave Writer, 
um, I, was, I was happy with it. And I was continuing to research and read um, about the history of computation. And uh, in that research, I came across a book, um, a, a series of books by uh, the author George Dyson. George, if you're interested in any of this stuff, George Dyson, he's a historian of computer technology and an incredible storyteller. Um, and so in, in one of these books, um, I came across this narrative which just, which just like lodged itself in my brain and in, in, in my heart. Um, and uh, it has sort of changed my work for the last, I'd say, seven years or so. But the story goes um, something like this. Um, during the Second World War, uh, the US government began weaponizing computers, essentially, right? Um, so this is uh, an image of a computer called ENIAC, um, and it is essentially um, one of its purposes was to calculate the ex exceedingly complex ballistic trajectories of missiles. Um, and then it was used um, as part of the, um, uh, it, it, was, it was used as part of the war effort. Um, it, it came to be that we wanted to develop the atomic bomb. And uh, one of the fears, Oppenheimer um, talks about this often, is we really didn't know, we couldn't, we didn't have the brain power to calculate what the blast yield of the atomic bomb would be. Um, he, he would say, it would be very devastating, but it could also maybe destroy the planet. We don't know. We can't do the math. Um, so these programmers were engaged by the U.S. government to begin working on this problem. Um, and these are uh, a variety of the, the engineers and programmers um, who, who worked on the supercomputer, um, uh, a supercomputer uh, at the Institute for Advanced St uh, Studies, uh, which calculated, like successfully calculated the blast yield of the bombs um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and they were very successful at this like, most terrible purpose. Um, Afterwards, though, the US government was sort of like, we don't need this computer anymore, we guess. <laughs> so scientists, why don't you just use it for what you think is interesting, and um, that will be great. So these, these engineers and scientists were like, we have the most powerful computer on the planet. We should open up its use to the scientific community. And so they made a call for projects, um, and they chose the project um, of this fellow. His name is Niels Albericelli. Um, he's an uh, Italian and Swedish um, biologist and mathematician. And he, his project proposal was to use the supercomputer um, at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, to understand how single cell organisms survive, um, how they evolve, how they grow, how they become more complex organisms. And what struck me about this story is here is this one machine. And at first, it's used to create the most destructive force our species has ever endeavored to create, and then immediately afterward used to understand the origins of life um, and, and, and survival of life. That parody just like struck me in a way, I didn't know what <laughs> I wanted to do with this. Um, it's, it's, and I, can, I continue to have lots of questions about why I'm interested in, in this relationship. But again, this tension between the technology, um, having sort of a hopeful, utopic vision of ongoingness and survival, but also this um, quality of destruction, which is just so embedded in so many of our technologies. So I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I, um, I got Baricelli's original code, his paper, um, the, 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 the research that he was doing. I, mean, I, I was reading it, I, didn't under, I understood maybe like 12% of it. Um, so I began working with a, a collaborator, a software engineer, um, his name is Michael Mack. And he's like my best friend now, um, because he explains to me all of this sort of complex uh, mathematics. And what you're looking at here in Baricelli's paper, um, this field of numbers, I don't know if you can tell that they're numbers, but each of these individual points is a number. And each of those individual points um, is what Baricelli called a bionumeric organism. He gave these, these um, numbers, basically represent packets of data which have personalities. Some of these organisms are really passive and just like want to be left alone. Others are super aggressive. They want to eat all the resources around them. Um, others are extremely, they don't care about resources. They just want to hurt their neighbors. But Baricelli's, um, he, he, his, his, his goal was to see if they can reach harmony. Can these um, 
uh, these tribes, these, uh, these different personalities, can they reach some kind of state of survival? And so he would generate basically um, generations of these. So if you look down here, you can see this first line of numbers is like the first generation of these organisms. Second line is the second generation, third, third and so forth for hundreds of generations. You can see some of the organisms die off and disappear. Others become very successful and sort of take over large areas of, um, uh, of, of the field. So the x-axis um, is the organisms and the y-axis is, is time. And then you get to see their interaction. To me, this was just like a textile, right? As a weaver, that idea of building up this surface line by line from the bottom up, like this is, this is weaving. This is, <laughs> this is simply already a textile. And so I, I was like, I want um, to grow weave structures. I want to use this software, I want to adapt it to grow um, textiles, basically. Um, so I'm describing this like it happened all like in a weekend. <laughs> so this is quite a long, uh, uh, you know, a, a, year, a year plus long kind of research. Um, and working with the software engineer, we were able to do it. Um, rather than design this, these textiles, we're growing them using Baricelli's original software. Um, and so what you see, the best way we've found to describe it, um, the bionumeric organisms, we basically dress them up, like we dress them up in weave structures. Like we, we, it's like they're wearing a coat, like a, an outfit of a weave structure. And so as they grow and interact, those weave structures change along with them. Um, and I was just uh, amazed that it worked actually in the end. So for those of you who took the workshop this morning, these are eight end shaded satins for four colors. Um, and you can sort of see like this yellow area is one organism sort of growing and occupying space. Uh, these areas are the organisms blending together, like they're becoming a new organism. And through this, so many unexpected things happen, like these sort of ghosts in the machine, kinds of surfaces we weren't expecting, um, hidden structures that we couldn't even see um, in the sort of um, uh, in the software itself. Um, and I didn't know what to do with these. Uh, they, they were really exciting to me. I was like, do I need to make these into sculptures? Are they paintings? Are they uh, just weavings? I, I was spending a lot of time asking myself these questions. Um, here's another example. Uh, yeah, just really unexpected things um, emerging through, through these interactions. But in my research, um, I'd come across a line in, again, George Dyson's writing, where he describes Baricelli's on the output, like these, um, these fields, he described them as abstractions of Darwin's theory of evolution. And I, when I read that word abstraction, I was like, oh, it's just like when um, the mid-century modern painters um, the Ab X painters, Lee Krasner, um, when they talk about you can only abstract from life, right? Abstraction must come from life. It's like here are these abstractions of life. Um, and so I chose, uh, again, maybe had this deep desire <laughs> in my past to return um, to painting. Um, here's an example of the weave structures wearing um, sort of twill. This is, this is like a damask, right? It's white on white, but you can only see the structures by where you are standing in relationship to the light. Um, so uh, I was thinking, oh, I want to return these surfaces, um, which I was experimenting with on tables and um, on, the, on, on, on plinths. Um, I want to return them to um, the, the language of abstraction, sort of the surface of, of painting. Um, this is my collaborator, Michael Mack. Uh, He's, he's like the person who helps me understand <laughs> the math. And um, just as an aside, uh, collaborating with him, he's not an artist, right? He's, a, he's an engineer. Um, but when you collaborate with someone who is so skilled at something you are so ignorant about, they're able to ask you questions that you couldn't even imagine you would ask. So one of the things he said is, you know, Bercelli was looking for harmony. In the end, he wanted things to survive. But because of the limitation of the computing power, he couldn't ask certain questions like, what if the goal is uh, total domination, right? What if the goal isn't survival? What if the goal is, what if the goal is like, how do things end? What does disaster look like? Um, those questions were deep in my mind at this time, but um, the software we end up calling BioLoom, 
Um, and uh, I know it's cringy a little bit, but I <laughs> he, he is, I, I give him a lot of, of creative freedom over naming these things. Um, so I returned these textiles to sort of a painterly surface. Um, I returned them to the space of the wall um, as, I think, a way to address that idea of um, sort of mid-century modern, this abstract painting um, notion. But also, I, like, I, I felt like I could be a painter again <laughs> for the first time since I was um, uh, a student. And um, again, the, some of the qualities become about color, about composition, about line. Um, and uh, in the exhibitions, I always notice how people have this sort of um, experience of sort of going in to the surface um, because from a distance, they just seem um, like areas of you know, blocked color. But as you get closer, all of this sort of frenetic, this sort of living kind of energy um, starts to emerge. Uh, so I want to close with this question about disaster, <laughs> um, not to uh, create a sense of hopelessness, um, but uh, I was at this, uh, at this point where I was thinking a lot about um, the end, like how do these organisms reach an end? And so we were working to sort of bring um, all that activity by limiting resources further and further and further, um, the organisms start to die off. And what I didn't expect was that the result would be a triangle Right, that, that this form <laughs> is embedded, right? As there are less resources, the organisms eventually disappear at a certain point. Um, and so this textile is, is describing that, right? It is, um, I didn't plan for this triangle, <laughs> but uh, amazingly, that is sort of what happens every time. Um, and I wove this at the, the Praxis Fiber Workshop, a residency um, in Cleveland, amazing res residency for those of you who are interested in this process. Um, I got to use their indigo vats, which they, you know, they grow natural indigo there. Um, so that is where the sort of blue comes from. But I was thinking about a glacier melting. I was thinking about um, the sort of uh, the disappearance of, of life. And um, it just so happened that uh, my dear friend um, brought uh, her niece to the um, studio. And, and Eloise, she was really... Uh, thrilled by this loom. And so she got to weave on it. This is like, you know, a $90,000 tool. And she was, she was really great at it. Um, but it struck me that um, if we sort of believe the scientists, um, when Eloise is my age, we'll live on a planet with no fish in the ocean. This is not 100, 200 years from now, right? This is an imminent kind of future. And so uh, as I was looking at this textile, I was like, oh gosh, this is not abstract, right? This is real. This is like a, a, a real problem of our obsession with technology, our obsession um, with petrochemicals. Um, and so I decided to weave the second textile. They are sort of in, in, um, in relationship to each other. From a distance, it just looks like a black kind of Malevich sort of square. As you get closer, you begin to see this activity and then on very close inspection, um, what's happening here basically is I was trying to figure out if I could get the organisms um, through, through uh, a lot of iterations, if I could get them to reach kind of a critical point of consumption and then find a way to, um, um, to heal their, their practices <laughs> uh, and then continue living. So you can sort of see there's this critical moment um, in the textile where things are starting to get pretty dire, but they're able to backtrack. They're able to find their way back to ongoingness. And I think that this is something um, uh, really important to me. You know, as a weaver, I see everything in the world through weaving, and weaving doesn't always offer the most practical answers <laughs> to things like climate crisis, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I see the, I think about the world through these um, interlacements, through these series of, of interactions. And that's how I feel like I can become intimate with these subjects, which are so vast and so scary. Um, and so I think my hope with a lot of this work is that, that it at least um, invites the viewer to ask a question like, how was this made? Oh, it was made using this digital loom. What is a digital loom? The digital loom relates um, to this, uh, the, the history of this jacquard loom, um, which is the beginning of industrialization, which brings us to like this crisis that we're in. Maybe a lot to hope for maybe a lot to hope for, um, but that continues uh, to be my hope. So 
thank you so much uh, for your attention. And, uh, I think we have some time for questions. There will be a mic that comes to you um, if you have questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about your process with your collaborator. Where are you? I can't, I can't, oh, okay. Hi, sorry. Um, and like, if you could speak to how your work inform each other's work. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious where you got the collaborator. Um, That's a great question. <laughs> These people are out there. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> go on if, you have, if there's more. No, I just, I think it's really interesting because you, it seems like you wouldn't be able to do the work without no. this other person and that's an interesting dynamic. It is. In um, art. I mean, in, in some ways, I collaborate with machines already and I wouldn't be able to make these textiles without this sort of artificial, creative um, machine. Um, but when you collaborate, when, when I collaborate with, with Michael, he is very um, disinterested in art. Uh, he, has, I, he has affected my life so deeply, I feel like Maybe have affected his life in some ways, I hope. But in general, you know, he's a game designer. He's in the grind of making um, apps. Um, and we, we meet at this strange place where it's like he's curious about this history of his field, which he didn't know at all until I asked him about it. And then so he read this paper. And I was like, yeah, this sounds very interesting to me to, to, to work on. And, um, I, I think that I, I don't like so much to be isolated as an artist. <laughs> um, it, it's funny because weaving can be a very, very isolating process, but it can also be very, um, if you ever go to, um, if you come to the University of Oregon where I teach, all the looms are in a big room together and there's kind of a social quality to it. And I think that actually just helps thinking, like being with other people. Um, so I love, I love collaborating with him. Um, it, it's, also, it's also interesting because he has a, a whole other language of propriet, of, um, proprietary knowledge, he wants to guard things pretty closely. I, I used to show people what the software actually looks like. Um, I, like. I made a video of it and posted it somewhere and he was like, you can't do that because we, we, you know, we need to protect that intellectual knowledge. And I'm like, no, everything should be free. <laughs> I, want, I want people to see. And so there are interesting tensions like that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, yeah, I don't mind the sense that I, I can't do things alone. Um, another collaborator question. Um, thank you, first of all. This was such a beautiful lecture. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, I'm asking less about Michael as a collaborator and more of the machines and the AI uh -huh. as a collaborator. Um, a lot of my practice is about like futurizing these like methods of care and so much mm. of it is in relation to AI mm -hmm. and how we treat it as a collaborator. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about these entities as artists mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and these structures and the AI as an artist in collaboration with you. Yeah. And yeah. when you present this work to the world, of course it's your work, but I'm so interested in this notion of introducing the AI also yeah, yeah, as yeah, yeah. an artist of yeah. like equal ground, and sure, as sure, that sure. said, what is the politics there? I'm oh, it's a lot of politics. You so know, many politics. Um, I guess one, w one way I would first, dis uh, I have two answers for you. The first one is sort of like, artists have always collaborated with technology, and each new technology comes with a lot of suspicion, right? So AI, you know, uh, you can read on, uh, you know, the news about uh, AI, artists submitting work to competitions and winning and people being upset. We should be suspicious of AI because you know, it reflects only the programmers who have trained it, right? And those programmers, their political intentions, their understanding of the world, it actually gets embedded. I mean, we know this from like facial recognition, right? Black people don't exist, didn't exist to a lot of facial recognition technologies because the, the, the control group, guess what, they were all white students um, in, in universities. So those problems are, are deeply embedded. And so we should be suspicious. And, and you know, and unfortunately, the, the data is so inaccessible. No one, no, the, the, a lay person could never read um, the, the, the data and understand those issues. We only get to experience them um, as a result. But um, in general, like the sewing needle, right? Uh, the the uh, sewing needle made out of a bird's 
bones is replaced by a steel sewing needle, which is replaced by a sewing machine, which is replaced by a computer embroidery machine, which is replaced by a TC2 loom, on and on and on. And so artificial intelligence is just one of a chain of those technologies. And I think at every stage, um, artists wonder, how is this tool changing um, the way I exist as an artist and as a person? How does it change the work? Um, and, and we have to be very suspicious, I think, of new technologies. Um, it's sort of like uh, 3D printing, right? It's supposed to like, the, I remember, <laughs> it was supposed to replace all the tools in the sculpture studio and it would take us back to the moon and, and all of this stuff. And um, it didn't do that. Um, and you know, we've sort of, we have to sort of continue working with these tools um, and, to, and be, be critical of them to see where the balance um, can come from, you know. Uh, I think if we're just outright Luddites, you know, if we reject the technologies, someone else, someone else will figure out how to use them um, in the world. Uh, and I would hope that it's, it's maybe conscientious and concerned people who use these technologies, not just um, corporations. You know? Sorry, that's kind of a long-winded answer for that. But. No, we like the long-winded answers. <laughs> uh, hi, Ruben Tlushkin, 4D Design. Um, thank you for this just wonderful talk. Um, you spoke really compellingly about the relationship like between the development of technology and, and just the war of, of world powers and the like binary utopia destruction. And um, I was just, you know, as a Cranbrook graduate, uh, I'm, I'm curious like if you, had any encounters or, or thoughts about Detroit, just as a, like, they called it the arsenal of, of democracy. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's here such that relationship between technological innovation and, you know, um, American dominance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. especially in that mid-century period. Um, so I'm just, you had me thinking about that, I'm curious, just, if you wanted to just riff on Detroit, go nuts. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the auto industry, is, this is like a, a key industry that has brought us to crisis in, in lots of ways. And um, we can think about, um, you know, we can think about, Detroit, we, we can sort of, I'm, I'm very suspicious of, of extremist stances. And if you can tell, I'm very interested in sort of this razor edge in the middle. Um, and, and industry in so many ways, it's like, um, it's just people still, right? Like the, the, the auto industry or the oil industry, it's also like just people trying to survive in the world and then all the way up to um, the super wealthy <laughs> trying to like manipulate um, their, their, the, you know, to, to better their circumstances. Um, and so I, I think sometimes, um, if you know this, um, this idea that uh, it, it's very, very hard to predict what individuals will do but it is much easier to predict what groups will do. And sometimes the desires of individuals, even like all of us in this room, <laughs> like the desires of us as individuals might transform if we were all to try and act as a group, right? So I, I think about, like, when I think about uh, what has happened in Detroit, what is, what is growing in Detroit, um, I, I think that trying to overlay like um, to too much theory about the powers that are trading, um, trading in capital, trading in, in lives, um, we get very disconnected from encountering the people who, who are affected um, by those things. So I, um, I'm not sure if, if that is, uh, there's a lot more I want to say about that, but. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, people first, I think, and then the rest uh, should come into place. Amen. Hi, um, can you share the pixel story? Oh yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, a, it's like my best story, really. Uh, when I was 18, I um, was uh, an intern, a gallery intern, just moving, like, preparator sort of work and moving things around. And um, you know, the, the pixel is this funny thing. We, we don't even, it's almost like a force of nature to us now. We don't even think that it had to be engineered or designed or invented. Um, and this fellow walked into the gallery, his name is Russell A. Kirch, and he was the inventor of the Pixel. He made it at Bell Labs, um, 
and uh, you know he likes to talk about it, as you can imagine. Um, he pulled out um, in his wallet, he has this crumpled photo of a baby, his, its nephew, and it's the first digital image. Like, just, there was a first digital image. Um, and the weirdest thing is, as he talked about it, he it feels like it's his greatest failure. That the pixel that he designed, um, you know, of course in a team and with other collaborators, he felt like it was a major failure. And uh, the reason is he designed it on a grid. And he, he described that, okay, it just seemed to make sense in terms of our engineering at the time, pixels should be on a grid. Um, but he was like, if, at that critical moment, if you take a square, cut it in half diagonally, you get two right triangles, and suddenly you've doubled the amount of resolution power we could have had in the beginning of this whole. But because now everything, it's very hard to reverse engineer that. All the systems now, everything works on the grid. The software works on the grid. Everything is gridded. He was like, I can't imagine what artists or designers would use, photographers, uh, filmmakers, with just like, an, iso, uh, you know, an isometric isohedron kind of um, grid. Uh, so he was also like uh, thinking about amorphous pixels and there were all these other things that um, he had wished he had done at that critical moment that would have changed uh, technology, like our screens basically, uh, in, entirely. You know. So very interesting. I'm not sure what we are, how we're doing on time, actually. I have no idea what, what's, where we are. One more? I'll be here tomorrow if you want to, like. Thank you. Thank you.